Go for it. Are you going to keep doing that? Yeah. OK. I'm not. All right. Welcome to Debug Production Application Issues using System Center Operations Manager. And really, we had Microsoft Visual Studio Team Foundation Server 2012. And have you ever noticed Microsoft products, the product names keep getting longer? I'll tell you the secret behind that. You get a job in marketing. That's their job. Every release cycle, they come up with a new name. That's how they stay employed. In either case, fundamentally what we're going to talk about is how developers and IT pros can get along a little better by having tools that know how to communicate. Because we've proven that humans, we're having a lot of trouble with this. Um, so we're going to try and make that a little better. So my name is Brian Randall. I'm Mickey Gousset. And we're definitely not Hans and Franz. Um, <laughs> so the big issue comes down to this. When we think about software development, particularly custom software development uh, for your organizations, we run into a lot of impediments, things that block our ability to succeed. And on this diagram, you'll notice we've got some green sides and we got the blue side. And in this context, green represents the developer world, where we go through, we talk to our users, we try and figure out what they want, and we put that on our product backlog. And one of the big problems we have there is this whole misunderstood requirements, knowing what people want. We also have conflicting priorities, right? What the users want, what the users have the ability to pay for through different types of budgeting. And then there's this whole issue of development, where we go through and we try and implement the software solution. And then on the operations side, we have this whole issue of how does our software that we build get into production for the users? How is it monitored? How is it maintained? Ultimately, this is a cyclical process. In the industry at large right now, the big term around this whole world is called application lifecycle management. The idea of managing an application from idea, from birth, all the way to death. The problem is for developers, we've often lived in this world of just the SDLC, the software development lifecycle, where we focus on primarily just writing code and throwing it over the wall. The IT pros in the house are then forced to, number one, get it deployed, number two, keep it running OK. And in the face of bad things happening, deflect blame from the IT pros back to the developers. So ultimately what we're trying to do in the industry is, number one, monitor things from start to finish, and then close the loop so that through tools and technology, but also with good process where, yes, the humans do occasionally talk to each other, we can ship things on time, on budget, but with higher quality. And when something does go wrong from a performance perspective, and we'll talk about what performance means to us, the IT pro can respond appropriately, get the developers to fix it, and continue that cycle. So when we talk about where we're at in this talk, we have three major sections we're going to focus on. And the first issue is this notion of operations readiness requirements are not met. One of the big problems we have with operational issues is who finds out about it first? Now, when I say who, there's two core people here. We have the IT pros who are managing the data center, managing the production servers, and then we have the developers. Well, we know it's neither of those people that find the problem first, right? It's the users. And depending upon the user who finds it, there's a little bit of pain and suffering that's going to come our way, right? The higher up on the totem pole the person has the problem, right, the more pain that gets raised and, you know, the adage, it all flows downhill, right? So fundamentally, production errors are not caught quickly enough. And when we think about production errors, we're thinking about, number one, the application is not performant from a speed perspective. You know, as we did the warm-up, we talked about the fact that there's sometimes a cognitive dissonance between the developer side and the IT pros because, well, you just get faster hardware. Well, why don't you write better code? Well, it goes both ways, right? But ultimately, it doesn't matter because the person who's yelling and screaming at you on the phone or sending you bang emails and wanting to you know, rip your heart out doesn't care. And so we need to have a better way to do this. So fundamentally, it comes down to being able to monitor production applications. We want to go further than just the basic stuff. We want to be able to get into the application's guts and understand any critical issues that go wrong. And we want to be able to do this in as a non-invasive way as possible, and we want to do it so that the developers don't have to write a bunch of custom code. Fundamentally, one of the problems we have with developers is that we like to write code. And we'll often take the approach that, oh, well, we need to write it this way because it'll be better. And that's just an extra risk. Developers need to be focused on that product backlog, those requirements from users, which is how to make the application better. Users do not care about your coding language, and users do not care about the plumbing. They care about the results that show up on their screen, and their printed output, on their phones, et cetera. 
And so for us to get that job done, we need some better tooling and support. Now, we built a demo environment, um, and the nice thing about this is we built it for Microsoft, and it's available for download. They published it. And the idea is that we have a domain. Uh, fundamentally, we're expecting, if you're here in this audience, that you are overall into the overall Microsoft experience. So you're going to have a domain and operations manager. So while we're doing this, we did it a little earlier, but I think we got the room as full as it's going to get right now. How many of you consider yourself to live on the operations side? You're an IT pro. Of those who raised your hand, how many of you have used System Center? Fantastic. Now, in our environment, we're going to monitor a web application running under Internet Information Server. And specifically, we're running this on Windows Server 2012, so iOS 8. Now, who considers themselves a developer first? OK, a few of you. How many of you use TFS or Visual Studio? OK. So you're in the right place. We got a little shaking hands. Team Foundation Server is the developer hub. It's where developers are going to store their source code. It's where they're going to track their work, where they're going to get things done. So for the IT pros, Operations Manager, in the case of System Center Operations Manager 2012 SP1, is where you're going to live. And for the developer, it's Visual Studio talking to Team Foundation Server. And what we're going to do here is have Operations Manager monitor IS monitor our web application, and then what it's going to do is be linked through a new feature in SP1 called TFS Work Item Synchronization. And what this is going to allow us to do is transfer alert data that SCOM has monitored and picked up from our production application and push it into Team Foundation Server. And this is going to be a bi-directional link so that the developers can communicate, and we have this audit trail, and we have this information going back and forth in a nice fashion. And so as an IT pro, you'll connect to Operations Manager using Ops Console, and developers will connect to Visual Studio, with Visual Studio to Team Foundation Server. You want to say anything? Not yet? Not yet. Not I'm yet. Yeah, you've got, you've got going. something to say. Now, so we wanted to show you that because we are using one large virtual machine. That's our logical config, we're all on one machine. And to do this, we thought it would be kind of a little crazy, in that I'm going to drive the keyboard whenever we're doing an IT Pro part of the demo. Mickey will tell me what to do and explain why I'm doing it. And then when it's time for the developer, we'll switch. So let's switch over to my machine over here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Let's try that one. Oh, that's where I really want to be, yes. Now. No, don't no, be wrong, after I'm done with you guys. I'm really glad to be here with you guys. So purple is the Visual Studio color this year, so that represents our developer desktop. And blue represents our operations manager. And I think the slide said we're going to show them some system center stuff. So, so you talk, I drive. So hi, I'm Mickey. I'm an IT pro. And Brian's written a web application. And the problem with Brian is he writes his web application and then he throws it over the wall and I've got to, to watch it and make sure it works. And every time I say there's an issue, he says it's my environment, not his code. So I want to prove him wrong. So part of we're going to prove you wrong is we're going to use APM to start monitoring your web application. What's APM? Application Performance Monitoring, something new in SCOM 2012 SP1. It used to be called Avacode. It used to be a different product until Microsoft acquired them. So if you'll go down to your taskbar and click on that little blue icon, open up the Operations Manager console. Those of you that use SCOM, you've, pro you've seen this console, you live it in, in, a, in a pretty much probably a daily basis. So we're on the monitoring tab. Now before you can get started monitoring Brian's web application, it's got to get discovered. So how it gets discovered is by loading up, say, the IS7 or the IS8 management, pack, management packs. And they have discoveries in there. And you can tune those discoveries. And Brian, you're on the monitoring tab. If you'll look in the folders at the top, if you go under application monitoring, .NET monitoring, there's an IS8 ASP.NET web application inventory. And it shows because of the way we've tuned our management packs, we've discovered Brian's application. Now, how, does, how did those applications get discovered? Well, by default, the management packs are, or that management pack is looking for a .aspx file in the root or a .asmx file in the root. But all of that can be configured and tuned to, to do the discovery the way you want to. Now, because we found the website, now we can actually do the monitoring. So how do we configure the actual monitoring? How many people in here have built management packs before? 
How many people have done it using, say, the old authoring tool or the Visual Studio extensions? Okay, how many have done it using the authoring workspace? Awesome. So we're going to use the authoring workspace. So if you'll click on the authoring workspace for me there, Brian. What we get with APM is we actually, so expand management pack templates. We actually get a management pack template for configuring our APM, our APM monitoring. And the beauty of that is it's a wizard. It's a wizard we can walk through that walks us through configuring everything we want to set for doing our monitoring. Now we've already, if you'll notice on the right hand side, we've already set up this monitoring for us because we went ahead and walked through the wizard. But we're going to look at the properties of, the mo of what we set up for monitoring. Because the properties that are there are going to be the same thing that you would see when you're walking through the wizard itself. So if you'll right click on monitor Fabricam Fiber website and go to properties for me. So a this big is dialogue. Yes, very big dialogue. So this is the website or, or that we've decided to monitor. So there's several different pieces, and I kind of want to go through the pieces to, to, to explain it just a little bit. So on this main page, what to monitor, this is showing all the different components that make up our web application. In this case, we've got one. But we could have multiple components that we're also monitoring. We could have other web services that we're monitoring as well. And all of those pieces, are, are, we tie them together here and say they form what we're trying to monitor. Now, what are those components, where do they come from? That's the discoveries that the IIS management packs do for us to find that information. You can also tag these, these what, you've, what you've created in an environment, like say QA or, or say dev. Say you've got the same application pushed to multiple environments. When tagging the environment, it actually puts the tag name in the, in the name of what you've named your monitoring. So it just makes it very easy to be able to tell, okay, this is the monitoring we're doing for that application for a dev perspective or a QA perspective. Now we're going to come back to this page. Okay, Brian? You okay, with me? I'm with you. So, but the first thing I want you to do is click the server side defaults tab. So this shows me the, just the default monitoring that we get with APM. What's APM going to do for us by default for, for all the components that we're monitoring? So for all the components that we're monitoring, we're, we've turned on performance event alerts, and we've turned on exception event alerts. I think that's, and that's one of the key things about APM. The P stands for performance in two contexts. Number one, is my application performing under my SLA as far as time to deliver results to the customer? Right, and that could be you know, page load times, how long it takes to execute a transaction, whether it be something to a shopping cart, generate a report, et cetera. So there's speed in the performance context. And then there's behavior, right? Sometimes an application appears to work, but the results don't match up. And the degree of how bad that is ranges from the screen seems to work, but the developer's hidden things with on error resume next, try catches where they eat at errors. Or it goes to the other thing, which in particular with web apps in ASP.NET would be the yellow screen of death, where all of a sudden there's this nice code dump that shows up on your intranet. So the key thing to APM is that it's looking at both those things, and we have a lot of knobs to tune, and that's what Mickey's going through right now. So real quick, but what's important to point out here is this performance event threshold. So the way like the performance eventing works is it tracks transactions. Now, what's a transaction? Well, it kind of depends on what you're monitoring. For, say, ASP.NET out of the box, it's the process request method. So it's when that process request method starts, it starts a transaction. And when you finish that process request method, it sees if it finished it in five seconds or less. If it finished it in less than five seconds, everybody's happy. If it takes longer than five seconds, it's going to throw an event. You can also, as you'll see, um, there is a way that you can specify your own, your, in your own code the methods that you want to be transactions. So you're able to, to get in the detailed information to set that. So if you'll, Brian, if you click the advanced settings button for me. So those are just the basic default settings. And if you go to the advanced settings on server side, this is where you can really get in more detail. So you can see we've still got our checkboxes, we've still got our performance event thresholds, but now we've got this sensitivity threshold. Are you a sensitive man? I am a sensitive you man. You are. I talked about my hair gel earlier this morning. That's true. But so I know your wife loves you, so that's good. So what does sensitivity threshold mean? Because this is important. Now, uh, pro tip, usually you don't mess with it. You leave it alone. But what does it mean? It means that inside that transaction, so inside, say, that process request method, we may be calling multiple other methods and classes. So, you know, calling multiple other functions. If those functions complete in less than 100 milliseconds, then they're not going to get included in the performance event that gets thrown if the entire transaction takes longer. 
So it's just a way of reducing the amount of information that shows up in the, so you're not overloaded with information. And a key data point on anything you see on the screens we show you, we've adjusted things for the demo environment so it'll run as fast as possible while you're seeing there's sort of not monitoring. You know that when you monitor with SCOM, you can have thresholds on how often you're collecting data and events. So just to be clear, we've lowered these things pretty low so we have stuff to show you. Um, I want to point out, um, you've got a couple of buttons over here under configure performance monitoring, that set namespace and set methods. What you can do there is you can say, hey, I want to include these namespaces in performance event information. Or I want to include these specific methods. So namespaces, broad generalization, um, are a container for, all your, for, for a certain number of methods. But the de deal is, by default, if you, it's, the events that you get back are not going to give you the parameters that were passed into the method. So it's not going to give you what you passed into that method, which you might need for debugging purposes. So if you want that information, then you've got to come in here and specify, for these methods, I want to gather the parameter information as well. Or for this namespace, for all the methods in that namespace, I want to gather the parameter information as well. So we've also got this configure exception event monitoring. So we can monitor exceptions. Now, by default, security and connectivity are monitored. Those are turned on. So we've also turned on application failures, right? But Brian would never write code that, that failed. But just in case. Just be clear. I am perfect. Thank you. Yes. He's a developer. So, but just in case, we can monitor application failures. Now, when we're monitoring for application failures, we're watching for exceptions. And there's two types of exceptions that we care about. There's what's called critical exceptions, and then there's, well, all exceptions. What's a critical exception? This is important. Critical exception is, okay, let me back up. So Brian, when he writes his code, <laughs> he can actually handle exceptions that show up, right? He can, he can do try-catch box. He can go, oh, okay, I, want, I can deal with this exception. But if Brian wasn't perfect, he might miss some of the exceptions, which can then lead to, you know, those ugly web page error messages that you see sometimes. Critical exceptions only means I'm only going to throw an event if I get an exception that Brian didn't handle. All exceptions means I'm going to throw an event any time an exception is thrown, even if Brian handles it. The bad thing about all exceptions is you may write your application where it actually is throwing an exception for a reason. And therefore, if you capture it with all exceptions, you're, you're kind of generating some false positives. So, Normally, in a QA or a dev environment, you run with all exceptions. In production, you run with critical. And then the same, same thing we had before, we can specify on, our, on those exception tracking buttons and the critical exception buttons specific methods so that we gather parameter information when those methods are thrown. Awesome, awesome. A couple of other things I want to point out on the screen. Thank you, Brian. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, we've also got three monitors here that we get out of the box that are determining, you know, the health of our application. So remember, monitors in SCOM can change state. So monitors are what can change things from green to yellow or green to red. Rules can only throw alerts. Monitors can also throw alerts, but as well as change state. So but things we're tracking out of the box here are things like exception events exceed a certain percentage over a certain interval or performance events exceed a certain percentage over a certain interval. If that happens, then the state of our application is going to change. And then, of course, you can also use groups to um, narrow down the servers that you're actually monitoring here. So this is the advanced tab. Now, this is the advanced tab for all the objects that we're monitoring on the server. If you go back to what to monitor, for each individual component, we can also customize the server-side monitoring. So it could be that for all of the components on the server, we want to do this. But for this specific component, we want to change the threshold. Or we don't care about events or alerts. And if you scroll down, for a specific component, we can also specify transactions. So maybe for our login page or for the web service, we want to make sure that's tracked as a transaction so it falls under our performance eventing and, and rules that we've set there. Right, and I think that what's really nice about this is kind of just gives you a nice visual of what APM monitors today. First of all, it's all about managed code, code that runs under the .NET Framework CLR. And so it supports ASP.NET web applications, ASP.NET web services, WCF services, and Windows services. It is a server monitoring tool, and today it's optimized for your enterprise, for your internal servers. Obviously, more good stuff will come as they do new releases. 
It does not set up to monitor, for example, desktop applications. So those are the key things to understand. It won't monitor your Java. It's very tightly wound today to the specific stack frame uh, related to data. Okay. All right, so if you'll cancel out of that for me. A couple other tabs I want to show you are client-side monitoring. So we've been talking server-side monitoring, right? Making sure the app's running right on the server. We can do client-side monitoring. So what's client-side monitoring? That means we're injecting some JavaScript in there to, to see how your JavaScript is running on your client side, or see how your page, to see how your page load is happening, to see how your WCF calls or your AJAX calls. So there's a caveat to client-side monitoring. You need to make sure your web application can support it, and I'll show you how you do that here in a second. But we can turn on client-side monitoring. And then if you go to client-side monitoring defaults for me. You mean client-side defaults? Client-side defaults, okay. thank you. Good. Can't, I can't read. Um, we, this is where we can set the defaults for the client-side monitoring. So we can capture performance event information, or again, exception information. That's JavaScript exceptions at that point. We can control, we can determine you know, the page load, we can see the threshold for our AJAX. We can configure it with this client IP address filtering. That's basically saying these are the clients we don't want to push this monitoring down to. So if you have certain clients that you don't want to push the monitoring down to, that's, what you, that's where you can do that. And then of course we've got an advanced settings button that we can set for on the client side perspective. You click the advanced settings, where again, this gives you just a little more where you can control the sampling. So for example, what that means is right now, we're looking at every request that comes in. If you change that to 90%, they don't, it only look at 90% of the requests that come in. We've still got the same kind of monitors that we had before. But now we can also gather data on how long it takes the images to load, how long it takes the scripts to load, how long it takes CSS to load. As you can imagine, the more of this stuff you turn on, what's gonna happen? It's, it's going to get slower. Best practice is if you're gonna start turning on the data collection items, you start with just images and scripts. And then you start turning on CSS, and then you turn on HTC if you, if, you, if, you, if you need it. And then if you're dealing with load balancers, you have to make sure the header is configured correctly on the, on the load balancer perspective. So this is where you can configure the, the header on the load balancer perspective. And again, you can control um, servers that you, that you access. Now, if you can't sell this for me, Brian. Sorry, I'm talking faster than Brian can click. He's rocking Slow now. down, dude. Slow down. I'm excited. So you'll notice how, and go back to client-side monitoring tab, you'll notice how, again, for each component, that we could then customize the client-side monitoring if we wanted to as well, just like we could with the server side. So you can get as specific as you want to and as detailed as you want to. It's the same kind of, same kind of things that we saw on the server-side monitoring as well. Cancel for me. Okay. So... A couple other things I want you to remember, though. Once you, figure, once you finish configuring your monitoring, and you can click cancel so we don't have to do an IIS reset or anything, um, you have to either do an IIS reset or, or a recycle or a restart. You're going to have to do a restart if it's the first time you set up your monitoring or if you're trying to disable all the monitoring on a server. If all you're doing is making a change, like changing a threshold, something like that, then you just do a recycle. Recycle's you know, a little bit easier than a restart. Now, Brian, if you'll go back to the monitoring workspace for me. Now, what do you get once you finish configuring this APM is if you want to go into monitoring.net monitoring, there's a monitor Fabricam Fiber website folder. So when I finish configuring my APM, it automatically creates this folder with these different views in it. If you expand the Fabricam web component as well, then I've got performance views as well. So it created all of these views for me, which is really kind of nice. Now, if you go back and, and, and select the monitor Fabricam website, then you'll notice that we are in a healthy state. Yay, this is good. Brian's application is working. <laughs> um, or at least it's not throwing errors. So, <laughs> but one other thing I want, so we're good to go. We're monitoring Brian's application. I want to show you one other thing, which is how do you determine or how do you check to see if the website or the application can handle client-side monitoring? So, Brian, if you'll go back under .NET monitoring and select the IS8 ASP web application inventory, and select the Fabricam fiber.web. Just, yeah, just click on it, don't right click, just click. Then over on the right hand side in task, you'll see a create client side monitoring compatibility, or check client side monitoring compatibility link. So if you click that link, it's gonna open up a little window where you can click a button, and it's gonna go out and, and check, and don't, don't run it right now, but it's gonna go out and check it, <laughs> and, and it's going to come back, and it's either going to tell you, hey, you're golden, do it. 
Or it's going to come back and say, you need to make this change, this change, this change. You make those changes, then you're compatible with client-side monitoring. So don't just turn on client-side monitoring before you check to make sure your web application can support it. And that's what we've got to do to configure things from the APM side. Any questions? You know, I'm, I'm kind of scared now because you're going to find all my dirty secrets. No, because you're great at what you do. Thank you. Now, do we want to check to see if we have any alerts, though? Ah, yes. Let's go ahead and do that. So let's go under active alerts. Oh, wow. Awesome. So check it out. So we've already got, we've got some alerts. Now, these, are, these have been in there for a while. So how many people in here have dealt with, like, their SCOM console having tons of alerts in them? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to show you the solution to that. So Brian, if you'll select them all and right-click and say close alert. <laughs> Woohoo! Look at that. No problems. We can go back to what we're doing. The pool. I think the pool's calling, yeah. I mean, that's what we do, right? All good. That's what Brian thinks we do. Okay. In all seriousness. But that's APM. That's how we get it configured. That's going into some of the details of how we get it, of, of, of how we get it configured and what all that stuff means. All right. So... Um, yeah, I think the only thing to say is to get that set up, and we're going to give you a link to the docs. The docs are actually very good. Give yourself some time. It takes a while to set up. You have to do um, some configuration for the alerts and configuration for some of the attachments that's going to get generated. Um, it's not horrible if you've used SCOM, but it does take a bit. If you're new to SCOM, it can be definitely overwhelming. I know we, we've been working on this for about six months with different beta releases, and um, it just takes a little while. But once you get it going, it's, it's really nice. So that's part one. Now... We think about one of the problems to continuous value delivery. We also have this issue of different management tools, right? Fundamentally, developers live in their world, their tools, primarily Visual Studio in this context, and you guys live in Operations Manager if you're an IT pro. And so we have these two different views of the world. And fundamentally, what we need to do is have a way to have data synchronized between us so we see it in its natural state. Right? Fundamentally, no one likes using someone else's tool that they're not comfortable with. You feel out of your element. It makes it hard to find the data. It doesn't operate the way you think it should work. And so we start thinking about this in the context of an impediment. Right? We have isolated tools and workflows. We think about what IT pros use and what developers use. So we start to enter this new world we like to call DevOps, right? which is something you're going to see a lot about in the next few years across the industry, both from Microsoft and everyone else, is that we want to have integrated incident management tools. Right, something that is deeply embedded from an application level all the way through to the production level of the servers, the hardware we use, the virtualization stacks, et cetera. And we want to be able to provide a common view for both operations and development on this data. And then fundamentally, what we really want to get down to is shared artifacts. Have the ability to have that data transformed and viewable where appropriate, but only have a single set of data that we're working on top of. There's nothing worse than saying, well, I collected this and it shows me this. Well, if I look at my log, it shows me this. And so what we want to do is have a common set of engines that gather the data. In this case, we're going to use APM. And it will present the data to the IT Pro and Operations Manager. But for a developer, I need to see it in a format that is usable to me. And better yet, if it's in a format that my tool of choice, Visual Studio, can take action on and lead me to the path of happiness. So I think at this point, we have, we're kind of in this transition stage. We need to show you how System Center Operations Manager can communicate with Team Foundation Server. And then I guess we're going to actually try and run them with a web application and see if it performs as expected. Exactly. So Brian, I know Brian uses TFS, right? He stays in Visual Studio all day. He's a big code monkey. Oh, you know what? What? Yeah, never mind. We'll, okay. show, we'll show him after. We'll show him yes, after. we'll show him after. Okay. So he's a big code monkey. And so I know he wants to be, able to, know, to be able to track things in Visual Studio. If there's an issue with this production application, he wants to be able to associate his code with it and just basically live in his environment. So I know there's integration now with SCOM 2012 SP1 with Team Foundation Server and SCOM. Right, and specifically Team Foundation Server 2012 Update 1 or later. Okay, thank you. Brian knows his tool. So... The way that we get that integration is there's a work item synchronization management pack that comes with SP1. So we import that work item synchronization management pack. So once we import that work item synchronization management pack, Brian, if you'll go to the authoring workspace, then you'll notice under management pack templates, we have a TFS work item synchronization template. 
This lets us walk through a wizard that's going to configure how we could sync with TFS. So, uh, as you can see, we've already done it just to kind of prevent some of the latencies we might see, but we're going to walk through that and see what it looks like. It's not that bad, actually. If you right-click and go to Properties, we've got two, two tabs. We've got the Server Settings tab. Now, in the Server Settings tab, we specify our team project collection. So let me back up for those of you that don't know what Team Foundation Server is or how it's configured. In Team Foundation Server, we have team projects. So that's where we store the work items, like the bugs or the requirements. And that's where we store our source code related to the project that we're working on. And then those projects are also grouped into project collections. So what we've got to specify is the project collection that we want to talk to so that then we'll be able to know what team, so then we can access those team projects in there. We've got to specify our, our resource pool for, for SCOM. And we've got to specify a run as account. So this is going to be the account we use for connecting up to TFS. The key thing about the project collection URL is for most properly configured development environments in most enterprises, you only really have one of them. There's certain needs where you might have multiples in a corporate environment, but typically that's a mistake made on the deployment side. So it's generally pretty straightforward that you only have to have one target. But t the management pack and TFS are flexible enough to where you can have different applications monitored and publishing their alert data to different Team Foundation servers. And then if you go to project settings, for this particular um, project, this is how we've configured where we want stuff to go. So we're specifying the team project that we want to connect to. So we've created a team project in TFS. So that's our project in TFS called Fabric and Fiber. And then we have, an air, we have this area path. Work items in TFS have a, have a way of adding structure to them so you can query on them and filter on them. So in this case, we're saying our area path is Fabric and Fiber, which is the project name. And then we've created a sub area called Website. So any work items we create or any alerts that we take from SCOM and send to TFS are going to create a work item in TFS already set to the area path of Fabric and Fiber website. So then Brian can, when he associates its code with it, we get all this reporting on the TFS side, and it's really freaking cool. And just like we had that granularity on APM, where we have default settings for the logical group, and then we can get more granular per component, the same thing happens here. Once again, depending upon the size of your enterprise, you actually might have multiple teams building your application that you're monitoring. And you might need to route different types of events. For example, web events go to a particular team and a particular team project, and then web service events go to another one. So that's why we have this list here. This is the default if nothing's been mapped. And then for each one, you can have a different setting, as long as it's on that same Team Foundation server and collection that we configured on the server side. And if you see the application component section right there, that's where we can take each of the components in our web application and either select them all or select individual ones. and have So we can have each component go to a different team project or go to the same team project, but a different area as far as the work items were, were determined. So the, the key word is just flexibility. A exactly. So, so we'll cancel out this and go back to the slide for a second. Let's put this from a logical perspective back in. And then and, maybe we should also then, well, yeah, okay. Just trust me. Trust? Oh, the pretty diagram. Oh, it's pretty. I made it. <laughs> a square. Ooh, so a square. we've got our Team Foundation server, and we've got our SCOM server, right? So if we go inside our Team Foundation server, we've got our project collection. And in that project collection, we actually have our Fabricam Fiber team project. And we may have other team projects in our project collection as well. So that's. That's what's happening on the TFS side. And what we just did is over on the SCOM side, we created a, a, a TFS connector and where it's going to point to Fabricam Fiber. Now, what's beautiful about this connector is it's two-way. So as we update the alert and it creates a work item, we're going to get two-way synchronization. It's going to know that alert's tied to that work item. As the work item gets updated, the alert gets updated. Um, you're going to see that the alerts can have attachments. So when we talk, talk, talk in IntelliTrace files, we're able to take those attachments and pass those attachments back over into our team project so they're part of the work item so that Brian can access them as he needs to. It's really cool. But that's the logical diagram of what, we're, of what we've just accomplished. Good? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back. So are we, are we ready to show them the app and see if it works? Almost. You got, you got one more? I have one more thing I want to show you. Okay. Which is, we're still in the, so we're still in the R3. If you'll expand the manager pack objects section right there in the R3. So 
since this is just a, a, a so this is a manager pack that we've imported, the work item synchronization, there are different overrides and different that you can do to tune it. And I just wanted to point out, if you select object discoveries for me, Brian. Oh, cool, you have a lot of stuff listed here, more than I was expecting. So <laughs> there is an object discovery, I just want to point out, there's an object discovery related to TFS that where you specify these attachments, the IntelliTrace files, the things that it, the things that it, that it, that it finds, um, where the share, where that's supposed to go. You have to configure that. And I can't remember the name of the manager pack, Brian. I'm so sorry. I sprung this on you last minute. Um, but it's the alert attachment management pack. It's the pack. alert attachment management pack. So, and I know there's an override there where you have to specify, hey, use this share for dropping these IntelliTrace files. Because IntelliTrace files can get big, really big. So I just wanted to point that out. That is a configuration that you are wanting to make. So yes, Brian, we can go look at your precious website now. Hey, because it's, it's a thing of beauty. It is a thing of beauty. All right, well, I think it's time that you do a little driving. Okay. All right, so why don't you start Internet Explorer? Can I still use my machine, though? You can stay on your machine for now, but you're going to have to be a developer for a moment. Okay. So I'm on my machine. Maybe okay, go. and so this is just, by the way, and no, you don't need to help him out right now. Um, so the Internet's actually still working. No one broke it this morning. Uh, this is the homepage of the documentation. We'll give you the link for it. But this goes through in gory detail how to configure both APM and the TFS work item synchronization. So if you click on the Fabricant Fiber favorite link up there, this will take us to our website that's being monitored. And as you'll see, it is a tour de force of web application design. What'd you do? What'd you do to it? You broke it already? Sure, website. I think, yeah. There we go. And... You'll notice that there's dashboard tickets, customers, employees, but why don't you click on reports? Yeah, happy picture. Okay, so yes, obviously we want something bad to happen to prove why you want these tools. So go ahead and uh, close Internet Explorer, and let's go back to your tool and go to monitoring. Because everything you've told me is that if we go to monitoring and we go back to the alerts and right click and refresh, we might see some alerts. So you'll note that there's two different alerts there. If you click on the first one, you'll note down the bottom there's a description. You can zoom in for them maybe so you can see what's going on. Okay, so here we have an application failure, an exception, system web exception. It looks like we have a missing file. So we have a site.css file problem. And if you click on the second one and go down there um. and zoom in a little. Ah, system.null reference exception. Oh. Our favorite, right? If you're a developer, that is, you know, can be named any different things, but the bottom line is something didn't get initialized correctly. So let's go look at the details for this. Now, as we mentioned before, right, this is the IT Pro view. You have to know, see that you've got this, you've acknowledged this. Now, you take a quick look at this, and when you see things like system null exception, you might, be, might not write code, but you know that's not good, right? So right away, we're going to change the alert status, and we're going to assign this to engineering. Now, this is the standard workflow. You've got to track what's going on. You've acknowledged that you know what's going on. But by looking at it, you're going, this isn't because the, the disk drives have failed. This isn't because the SAN's down. It isn't because we're out of memory. Now the developer hosts something. Now that said, you're going to want to kind of you know, cover your tail. You're going to look at things in a little more detail. And this is where APM comes in really nice. This dialog is from APM. And so, Mickey, what is that link going to do if you click it? Is it going to cause something bad to happen, or is Oh, no. I think it'll be good. Is there, is there a bit of happiness and joy there? I think there could be a bit of happiness and joy there. Should okay. I click it? Right. And Mickey's going to click it. And the key thing is, from an op side, you have the ability to control access to this. And it turns out that you might want to let developers have at least read-only access to see this, because there's probably some pretty good data in here. So it's going to load up information that it gathered from monitoring our application. And if I remember correctly, this is pretty cool. Yep. Look at that. So what we see here is call stack data. We see that there's an exception that occurred, and we see object reference not set to an instance of an object. And for those of you who did COM in the day, right, we even got our H result. They're still alive and well, uh, floating around. And if you scroll down, you'll notice we get this nice call stack of showing our code that executed, which is in the bold black. And then the light gray, which we can turn on and off, shows system code as far as APM is concerned. 
In the case of system code, this is .NET framework code, right? It's, it's one of the uh, 97 rules to good programming is don't assume your framework is, is, is the buggy part, right? Start with your code first. Uh, when you have millions of people relying on the framework, the chance of you finding a bug in Microsoft's code is a lot less likely than finding a problem with your code. And so we can get a lot of great detail from here, and this really helps the IT pro from a, not so much a defensive mechanism, but just knowing that we're on the right track, that this really is a developer problem. Right, we see at the top of the stack, the top line is in code that belongs to our custom software shop. Right, it's not coming from our third party and it's not coming from some from server related event. Now, Mickey, there's a bunch of other tabs up there. Mm -hmm. What are all these things? I mean, this is all system service. I can understand this, but now you're going to go to this next thing. What, well, what's what's this similar is events? Ju it's just some other ways of, of aggregating information and giving you some detailed information. So similar events is going to show you similar events related to this one, and how they're related kind of depends. If it's, if it's an exception, a web application exception, it's based off of the exception class and the method that it came from. So if we had multiple um, exceptions that have been thrown, then, then those would be grouped together, and we'd be able to say, oh, we're seeing similar issues. So in this context, what happens if we saw, we're going to do questions at the end, if that's okay. Um, no. Um, I, I can't really hear you, and it's just I'm not going to do a good job of, of repeating. Imagine the database is down. So the website's trying to load, and then all of a sudden, 50, 60 null references come up. Well, that might take you down a different path to look at things, right? This is a more spurious area. In other words, the whole website's not down. It's in a particular area. So those related events will really help you there. Okay, or similar events. Now, what's related events? Maybe? Related events is basically grouping the events over a time period. So it's basically saying all, all of these events happen over the past minute, or the past five minutes, or the past ten minutes. So therefore, they could be related in some form or fashion, even though they're from different, different areas. Okay, and distributed? Distributed chains. We've only got one component in our, in our, what we're monitoring right now, but if we had multiple components, this would actually kind of show the chain of, of how the calls went, and where, where, where maybe we started here, and then the error occurred here. See, Things I know you like want that. this product for the pretty pictures. And then the last one, performance, performance counters. counters. Pretty obvious. We, we just booted up the VM this morning for the talk, so we're not going to have a lot of data. But obviously, you'll be able to get performance counter data right here in this view. And right here, this is an opportunity for developers and IT pros to come together and examine this. So if you get this installed, do a brown bag, do a lunch thing, get developers to come over, and sit down and show them some of the great stuff they can get out of this. On the other hand, if you're a developer that's trying to get your IT side to be more methodical in how it monitors production, you can show them this. And like I said, this VM we're using, you can download and play with yourself. And so this is a really a bonding opportunity to show that, look, we're going to gather this data, and look, there's stuff that's exactly what you want to see as a developer. But as an IT pro, it also provides you with that foundation for knowing what went wrong and what is the core cause. Do I need to worry about my data center, or do I just need to worry about getting my developers to fix it and make my users happy? All right. So it looks like some good stuff there. Now, we already assigned this to engineering. So now what I would like you to do is minimize the RDP window and switch to the other one. And so now this is the way I'm going to see the world. And so I'm going to start Visual Studio up. And what I want to show you that is there's also, if you click on the web access link, in 2010, we have a new web experience, which is really nice. And why, it's really, why I'm showing you guys this also, that are majority of IT pros, is that this is a dashboard that you can go to as long as you have access on your intranet. Okay. And you notice what I've done here, I've customized team favorites. And notice the first square from the left, operational issues. When we set up the binding between System Center Operations Manager and Team Foundation Server, if you have the right security settings, it automatically injects into the team project or team projects a new work item type called operational issue. Remember we talked about this notion of a common repository, a common view of data. So SCOM gathered the data, and it's put it into its repository. But now it's pushed that same data over into Team Foundation Server. But as a TFS developer, I need to see things as work items, because I have an entire workflow related to that. That's done automatically. We have a new work item called Operational Issue. And what I did was I created a query called Operational Issues. And so Mickey can click on this, and this will actually run the query right here in the web browser. So managers, stakeholders, people who have access to this can see what's going on also. Now, some of the details won't make sense to them. That's fine. 
The point is when they go to that home page, what do they want to see on that square? They want to see a green square with zero next to it. Okay? So now, Mickey, go ahead and close the web browser. And let's go over to Visual Studio. And what we have here, when you're working in Visual Studio, right, you have something called the Team Explorer. This is your home page, and it's got a number of different hubs. So, Mickey, if you click on the Work Items hub, what you'll see there is that he can double click on the operational issue query. And the nice thing is TFS, just like SCOMP, supports integration with things like email notifications. So we don't have to have people come looking at this. We can get email notifications. We can have custom services respond. Anytime a new issue comes in, we can be alerted. Now, we're going to double click on this and open it up. And first of all, notice under the description. It looks very similar. It's the exact same piece of data. And that link, we, if we click it, will take us to the exact same web dialog. This is why you want to get down and have developers and IT pros mingling, right? Little chocolate, little fudge. Because if you click that, and you've given them rights on the SCOM side, I can see that. I can go in and see the exact data that you saw from the console. Now, the first thing we're going to do, then, is we're going to acknowledge this and say, yes, we've accepted this. And you're going to want to save that. Now, what's interesting when I look at this is I'm going to go to that view, right, the APM view in that web page. I'm going to look at it. But that doesn't necessarily tell me all the details I want to know. So what we want to be able to do is see the data in a richer format. And so what I'm going to do is talk about how APM and SP1 of SCOM and Team Foundation Server SP1 in 2012 make this better. Now, I'm going to be honest. Something? Can I show something first? Okay. No, I just want to show how back on my operation side. Oh, you want to show that it's actually talking back and being yes. nice? Oh. Back on my operation side, yep. I've got down here Team Foundation Server Synchronization. That's right. Where I can see that Brian has acknowledged the alert. Oh, look at that. So I think if you go to details on the properties, if we go over here to the uh, history, we can see that the ticket was updated, and you'll notice that it was edited by Brian. OK? So incident is acknowledged. So we have this history report that you can see on the SCOM side. And if you look at TFS, TFS has its own history tab with the same thing. So we have this nice audit trail back and forth on what's going on. All right, so let's go back to the slides and talk about the last bit of technology we're going to use. And then we'll see if we can make this all come together. Now, on this last issue here, production incidents. So we now have a problem. Production has looked at, looked at and said, this looks to be a developer issue. You've engaged engineering, and you've said, look, figure out what's going on. Let's get a fix out there. Let's make our users happy. The problem is production errors are hard to fix, right? Granted, this is demo where we're having a lot of little fun here. But you all know, whether you're a developer or an IT pro, when bad things happen, that can mean late nights. So if you can get the right tools that are going to save you, ultimately, time and money and make your users happy, spend a little bit of extra money might be worth it. Now, Microsoft has introduced a new feature that we're going to use that's going to give us actual diagnostics. And it's called IntelliTrace in production. The idea behind it is that it will do an invasive monitoring session of your application. And it will gather very rich diagnostic data, data that can then be viewed in Visual Studio 2012 Ultimate Edition. Now, that is a requirement. The good news from a license perspective, you can deploy and license it anywhere you want. And the good news is IntelliTrace in production also has a command line package that you can deploy even to clients, so WPF applications, et cetera, that you can run on demand. You can also use it for servers that you don't have access to via SCOM. Sometimes you have environments that aren't accessible. As long as you can get this X copy deployable, so it doesn't leave a footprint, put it on a machine and start it up, you can gather this log. However, if you have SCOM, what's really great is that we're going to be able to control this from the System Center Operations Manager console, and we're going to have that traceability where we have shared artifacts being pushed from SCOM into TFS and back. Now, we use the term IntelliTrace everywhere just to the point that you can use it anywhere that .NET code runs in a modern environment. No Windows XP, sorry, um, and I pray for you if you're still supporting that. Um, to the god of IT, to the, any god you want to believe in, but I pray for you if you're supporting XP still. Now, with IntelliTrace in production, IntelliTrace everywhere, what we want to be able to do is get this extra data. So Mickey, if we go back to me as the developer, you're going to drive. I saw the, the, um, the data you showed me from APM, but 
I'd like to see if there's something better I can use. So there's this thing called IntelliTrace, and so once again, we want common artifacts. That APM data is great, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of good value there. But with IntelliTrace, I get a special feature. It's able to match up this call stack in memory with my source code. Through some configuration through team build and doing what's ca uh, ha called having a symbol server, when I do check-ins and when I do builds, TFS puts metadata into what's called a program database file, a PDB file. And there's two types of PDB files. There's lightweight ones and there's heavyweight ones for debug builds. But fundamentally, with those files, it lets IntelliTrace get really accurate and pinpoint what went wrong. And so if Mickey clicks on links, one thing you're going to see is that a new IntelliTrace log was automatically created. OK? Now, Mickey, go ahead and double click on that. Now, you'll notice it says file colon whack whack DevOps all. When Mickey made a point earlier about the alerts attachment management pack, so when you configure APM, you install this pack and you decide whether you want IntelliTrace logs created by APM, APM stored on a file share, or do you want them automatically attached to the work item inside TFS? Now, as Mickey said, these files can get large, particularly if you do a really long session. So you have to understand what is your backup strategy for your Team Foundation server, what's your disk space allocation. Most organizations I work with virtualize TFS, whether on VMware or Hyper-V, and so typically you're not having excessive amounts of disk space for most of your for development shops. Now, bigger shops like Boeing, Microsoft, I mean, they, Microsoft has uh, their current database is over 10 terabytes, okay? Yeah, they're not, they, they put that on some big iron. So you have to decide, though, what your storage capacity of TFS is. The file attached is probably a little better, because a lot of these log files you probably won't have to keep. You'll probably keep some for traceability and audibility, but most of them you will probably throw away. So the file share is a little more convenient. But you have the choice. OK, Mickey's going to click Yes, because we trust this location. And we get this dialog. This is called the IntelliTrace Summary. And Mickey, if you click on that system.null reference exception, I get really happy, because I see a call stack here, but I see something even better. Notice there's a button there, start debugging. Now, Mickey, I want you to do something before you click that button. Zoom back out and show the Solution Explorer tab. I want you all to be clear that there is no source code loaded in Visual Studio. Click the button, Mickey. Look what it did, though. Via the production log data that we got from, Avoc sorry, from uh, APM, it translated that into IntelliTrace format and once it was in IntelliTrace format, they were going to look at the metadata, and they found the source code file. And the key thing is it understands the, the distinction between deployment builds. So I push a build out. That build's related to a team build, which in turn has symbol data and is able to match up to the exact change set. My developers may have been working for another month on the code in this file. But they'll get to see it in the state it was in. And then they can say, oh, compare this version to the most current, and then maybe they can see we've already fixed the bug. We just need to push out the change. But right away, it takes me there. Now, the only thing that's bad about this, and I really love this, Mickey. I'm really happy. Okay. Thank you. But it's taking me just to the point. And here's the problem. There's this causality chain of, well, how did I get here? Now, I can see the call stack there. But what I really care about is what got pushed on. Something obviously came into me, because if you look at what happens there, I get a customer object passed in. Well, why is it null? Huh. OK. So if we go to the debug menu, I want to point out something. We are in debug mode. We're in what's called playback mode. We're in historical debugging mode. Okay? We're basically able to do a little time trial. Now, here we were able to go to a point in time and kind of just look around with everybody frozen. What I want to do is I want to jump into TARDIS and I want to go backwards. I want to do TiVo for my call stack. I want to rewind the stack. So go ahead and stop debugging and go to the operational issue, please. Right click on the tab. Close all but this. And click the drop down that says, not only do we accept it, but we're going to assign it. Please assign it to me. Save it. And now go back to the state. And here's what we're going to do we're going to say awaiting evidence. I didn't choose the naming, they did. And you notice it says resolution notes. Please put um, pretty please, Mickey, give me a full IntelliTrace log. I'm making a request. I'm putting it in writing. It's in my system, but it also will be in your system. Save that. I did. And now, 
What's going to happen? Remember that two-way sync. So it's going back over to SCOM, and so why don't you switch over to you, and we don't have to switch people. I'll just keep blabbing, and you can drive. Plus, you know this tool. OK, nothing there. We're going to refresh. Now, we set the interval, I think, to about 30 seconds in the VM, right? The default, I think, is uh, two minutes or five minutes, something like that. Um, it's five. Once again, depends on your server load and everything else. There it is. Right click, go to properties. And if you look under the history, we can see that information. Once you zoom in, that's tiny for me, and I'm oh, sorry. in front. Right? Additional evidence required, OK? So now, and there it is, pretty please. I asked nicely. So I've asked nicely, Mickey, can you, can you take me to the happy place? So why don't you close this? Thank you. Awesome. And what I want you to do is click on that. And if you scroll down to the corner, there's something that's really cool. This is with SP1 installed. We have an option to do IntelliTrace collection. So Mickey's going to start, and I'm going to talk about what's going on. So go ahead and start collecting. And then I need you to go back to the website, OK, once you get the collection started. So as I mentioned before, the IntelliTrace and production technology supports a X copy command line deployment structure, OK? Non-invasive, once it's down, you run it, you can actually delete it. The problem is, what if I have a web farm? What if I have, if our component structure was actually a website with a web service tier and a Windows daemon? Well, I have to go out to all those machines, X copy it, no. If it's being monitored here, I can click that button, and it's going to go push it out to everything that's being monitored, and it's going to collect a log from each environment. OK? Now, the website took a little second to start up. Now, this is the one thing to be aware of. This is invasive. This will impact overall performance, particularly by default, it turns the collection knob up to 11. IntelliTrace does support some customization, and they're working on some better tooling to do it. But the bottom line is you can narrow it down. You can narrow it down to just parts of your application, et cetera. Right now, I want everything. So what happens is it has to restart the application pool for the, for the website, right? Because the way the API works, they're using the .NET debugging and profiling APIs. So they have to get in at the top of the call stack where the CLR gets initialized and loaded into memory, OK? Once they do that, they can catch from the top. And basically, we're going to get that ability then to rewind. So now, Mickey, go ahead and click on our problem. Now, obviously, we need to have some idea. Well, we know this came from the report section of our application. So if we go to reproduce this, we're going to go to that part of the application and start trying to do the common workflow. If we can gather identity data for the user and it's an employee, well, of course, we're going to talk to them. What were you doing? Did you, did you notice this? Right? OK, we got the error. OK, go ahead and close that. Now, right now, IntelliJ is still monitoring. So if people are hitting the website, et cetera, they're, you know, they're going to notice things, but it'll still run. What we need to do is grab the log. So what he's going to do is he's going to go and collect the IntelliTrace snapshot. So go ahead and click that, run it. And once that gets done, we're going to take a look at what's going on. So go ahead and close that. Now, what I want you to do is give it back to me. I need that data. So Mickey's going to reassign it to engineering. He's going to apply that. Now, once again, the history will have all that data, et cetera. Notice, by the way, if you go back to the general tab, in the center, the ticket ID, right? That actually has the ID of the work item on the TFS side, right? So both sides know exactly what's going on. Now, Mickey did that. You say that now, because we want the website to go back to normal, he's going to stop collecting. He's going to turn off IntelliTrace, all right? And he'll click on it and stop. OK? So you only want to do this as long as you can. These files can get to be very, very large, okay? gigabytes if you let it run too long. By default, it does have a governor on it, though. It doesn't do, I think it's 100 megs by default, Something if I remember like correctly, um, which is configurable. OK, so found the problem again. Mm -hmm. You've given it back to me, so let's go back to Visual Studio. So let's switch back over to me. Now. If Mickey clicks the refresh little icon up there, yep, that one, once again, it's going to take a couple seconds to synchronize. And what we're waiting for is something else to show up in the list. We're looking for another attachment. This is going to be the detailed IntelliTrace log. OK? And there it is. And notice the difference. This one says a new IntelliTrace snapshot for the application pool. And by the way, 
if you have multiple websites or services running on that server, it is only going to affect those that share the application pool. Okay? So you don't have to worry about taking down your entire website, your entire environment. Okay? Double click, baby. Yes, I trust it. Oh, look at that. A lot more stuff there. Pretty cool. In fact, collapse exception data, Mickey. And by the way, there's some of this stuff was already there, but notice at the bottom I can see modules. Right? A common problem is, do I get the right DLLs in memory? Right? Is there a bad configuration problem? Okay? And how about system info? Okay, how much RAM available? Okay, we've got, looks like we're pretty good. All right, show me web requests. Oh, look at that. It will actually gather the inbound web requests so you can see where it's coming from. And also we're getting things like how long it took, status codes return, we got a 404, we might look at that. Okay. But what I want to do is go back to exception data. And if we take a look here, walking down the stack, what I see is that I've got three null reference exceptions. So I'm going to go to the bottom one. So that one right there. Yeah, that looks like it. Now do you start debugging, Mickey? You sure? I am. Okay. Now notice what happens, first of all. Two really cool things. Over in the gutter, on the left-hand side of the screen, I have on their side VCR buttons. Okay? It's highlighting the line of code, so zoom back out. And then we're going to talk about this stuff on the right in a moment. But Mickey, go up to the top, the top one, and let's see return to call site. Click the button. And notice what it did. If you know development, you'll notice it now jumped to a CSHTML file. This is an MVC4 application. And what happens is you do markup and you mix it with code that gets compiled when run. And what now it's doing is it's got the stuff that says app model customer cover, that's actually executable code that's dynamic. And what it's doing is it's, oh, click on current customer down at the bottom of the autos window. Equals null. Well, Mickey, click the back button on the VCR. Go up one. Go up one more. Oh, notice it's Davis Oz is the problem child. Oh. That employee doesn't have any tickets assigned to him. So his customer object that we're passing to summary.getCustomer is null. And then if we go over to the side, click on adio.net, execute reader, select. Oh, I can see where I tried to call and get the tickets. It took me all the way home. And if Mickey clicks the drop down that says all categories, you'll see that when you turn up to 11, they gather tons of runtime data. Now, like I said, it's invasive, and you can turn it down a bit, but I was able to get look at the adu.net code, the SQL that got passed to the database. This is money. And you only need one person to have Visual Studio Ultimate, because like I said, it's not cheap. It's the expensive one. But as long as you have one person doing this and you can create these logs, you think this would make people happy? Because now I know what the problem is. I can fix it. Mickey can help me get it pr pushed down to production. And what do we do? We ultimately can go back to SCOM. Go ahead and go back to SCOM. Okay. Right click on that puppy that's now back to, uh, should be acknowledged. Right click on it. And you can feel a lot better about going to set resolution state. Closed. Right. That, I think, is a compelling, happy story. Right? So when we think about this whole idea, and can you go back to the slides? Which one's, oh, it should be number one. Yes. Right? We basically are looking to redefine ALM in the modern era, right? Developers and IT pros should not view each other as adversaries. Now, granted, there should be some good-natured ribbing, right? I mean, you guys spend too much time with hardware, man. Be creative. Write some stuff. On the other hand, being a hardware geek, I mean, who doesn't love walking in and looking at you know, all those racks going, oh, 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 oh more power? Um, you know, I love the fact that I've got a laptop with 32 gigs of RAM. This is awesome, man. Um, but we think about what we're trying to do here. Microsoft is really trying to make life better for both sides of the house. Bring modern ALM tools to the developers, bring modern, modern monitoring tools to the IT Pro, and then break down the wall there. Notice there's no longer a line there. Let's have shared data that's transformed and viewable in your tool of choice yet create a traceability window so that we can see exactly what happened and both sides know what's going on. And granted, if you guys don't want to have a conversation, we could have done that whole thing back and forth. 
with just the alert system and maybe some email. Or maybe once in a while we'll get together and say, hey, you guys aren't so bad. This tool's kind of cool. All right? Would you like to say anything else? Because I think we're right down to how to get a hold of us. Uh, my email address, my Twitter handle, my blog address, which I need to blog more. <laughs> I think you do a better job of blogging. There's Mickey's information. Um, we're both consultants and specialize in these products, so if you want some help and want us to come cause trouble in person, we're happy to do that. Mickey will bring chocolate, I guarantee. Um, I'll bring in and out t-shirts, or if you live close, I'll bring in and out. Um, you want to get a hold of the VM? Go there. You'll find it on a gentleman named Brian Keller. Um, it's funny because Brian Keller, Brian Harry, and I are all involved in ALM. So there's an email going around. We suddenly have new last names, or I often refer to as Beavis. Um, in either case, the VM's available. It's fairly large, um, and you, you really need about you know, 8 gigs of RAM and an SSD or more RAM and a decent drive. Blogs again for some reason because you wanted to share that. APM, if you click that link, that'll take you to the documentation on the SCOM side on how to install. By the way, the slides are up on ComNet. You can download them, take them home, enjoy, share with your friends. And if we go next, we want to hear from you. Please, Please. do your feedback. Um, we love, that we, 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 you would not really probably understand unless you've spoken at a show what it's like inside the speaker room going through our scores. We care, we read every comment. Um, if you have time to do numbers and comments, we really appreciate that particularly. If you give us a great score, we appreciate that and why is fine. But if, if, you, if something made you unhappy, tell us about it. If you don't feel comfortable in person, uh, let us know. We want to make it better. We want to be able to educate you as effectively as possible. And if you hit next, it's online. And I think that's it. So we have a eight whole minutes. three minutes and no, 25 seconds. That. We have about eight minutes, because that was only set to 70 minutes. Oh, good. So we have time for questions like we were supposed to. So if you want to ask a question, mic. microphone, please. So then it's recorded, and then we, everyone has it for posterity. Otherwise, thank you so much. We're around all week, so feel free to seek us out and ask questions. We'll do our best to answer them. OK, so the lady's going to ask a question. Go ahead. Are there any other development um, frameworks that you hook into, that SCOM hooks into be beside um, Visual Basic, like Oracle Ajax? No, it's, it's the, the, the woman's question was basically, for APM monitoring, is this, uh, does it have alternative support? Right now, no. It's focused on .NET programs. So you can do C Sharp, VB.NET, uh, managed applications, and specifically websites, web services, and Windows services. That's the first release structure. Uh, and part of it has to do with the way the data is gathered and then transformed ultimately. IntelliTrace is a core.NET technology. Yes, sir. Uh, along the same lines, the, uh, I know Avacode in last year at MMS, they talked about Java monitoring. We have a lot of Java apps that are on Linux boxes. So those discoveries you talked about that are in the management pack for uh, ALM for uh, your .NET applications, could those also be applied to Java apps too? So the APM will not work for, with Java at all. Um, right now, it is a pure .NET structure. So um, Mickey, you would know better about well, the management the, pack the for APM, Java. The APM side is not going to work. So therefore, you're going to have to do cross plat. You're going to have to build your own custom management pack and build your own monitoring at that point and do you know cross plat. And that's always fun. If you've had to write a management pack for Linux, it's always fun. Um, and, and you know, we can't speak for Microsoft on what they're planning. Uh, but Microsoft on the TFS side has a, a large investment on bringing better cross-platform development. They have a product called Team Explorer Everywhere that allows you to connect to TFS in a native client on Linux and OS X, as well as on Windows. Uh, and it's optimized for Java developers. Uh, they have support for Java developers doing builds. So they are acutely aware of there's a customer need and demand for cross-platform technology support. Um, like I said, there's definitely no public comment. I haven't heard anything. Um, we would not definitely speak for Microsoft. But if they're interested in that, you need to let them know. They'll be there at the booth. You know, let them know that's important to you. Hello. When you're doing your monitoring, will it do SharePoint custom applications? Ooh. So my company does a lot of SharePoint development, and we just wrap inside of that. We'll create custom workflows. We'll create custom screens and pages, theming. So doing monitoring, will it do SharePoint applications? So first of all, SharePoint 2010 or SharePoint 2013? Which one? Which one? Yep. Both. Okay. So let me address the specific, a couple. I'll address it from the uh, development side. IntelliTrace, with update one, they added explicit support for IntelliTrace with SharePoint applications in 2010. Okay. With update two that shipped last week, 
they added support for SharePoint 2013. SharePoint 2013 also supports a new programming model called the app model, which means you basically provide your front end in a standard ASP.NET web application. So you get that, that would give it, you get all that stuff for free. And then when you start crossing boundaries, then it gets a little more nebulous because of, well, are you talking workflow that you're being monitored, et cetera. So the bottom line is IntelliTrace supports those technologies. Now the big issue is I have not tried to take his update to only shipped last week. My gut reaction is that no, because we haven't seen an update to SCOM with a new version of the APM pack that would understand that relationship. But the good news is at least on the IntelliTrace side, you could at least walk up manually with a collector, point it at your farm, and collect what's supported there. So you want to look at basically Visual Studio 2012 update 2, or it's now they're called a VS 2012.2 literally just shipped last week on Thursday, that has support for SharePoint 2013. And so at least you can do the manual side. Now, I haven't I heard anything. Know. Yeah, and so the APM pack, we, if you want to email us, we will get an answer, at least the best thing, answer we can give you. But like I said, my gut feel based on the fact that shipped last week and there's no update to SCOM, is you won't get the nice point at your SharePoint farm from SCOM mm. uh, today. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. uh, two questions. One, you mentioned TFS. Is it I didn't know if it was TFS 2012 or TFS 2010. No, TFS 2012, oh. update one or later. So there's update two shipped last week. Okay, and the second one is when you were doing the management pack, when you were making changes and you were pushing them out to the client, is it just best practice to always assume you have to do a reset, either ice reset or recycle? It's, it's going to actually, it'll actually give you an alert, a, a little warning alert that says, hey, you need to do a recycle or you need to do a restart or reset depending on, on, on what it is. But yes, in general, in my opinion, it's a best practice. If you change a configuration on your monitoring, then just go, to, then you need to go hit the recycle. Yeah, if you look at the summary tab, um, it'll actually, in bold, it actually have the warning triangle when you need to recycle or restart. Okay, thanks. Uh-huh. <clears throat> if you have apps that run fully compiled and deploy co like legacy apps, maybe not a Razor app, <clears throat> uh, what level of detail do the developers get to see? The in, IntelliTrace works in, with, against release builds and against debug builds, um, it, with or without symbols. It will give you that information. Um, it just there's, it can gather more data about some of the call stacks. So some things you don't always get a, a full stack, but it's it's actually very rich. So even without PDBs, it can yep. still link. It back works to without code. PDBs. Yes, it works without PDBs. Cool. Thanks. What about uh, .NET? Uh, uh, processes monitoring. For many reason, it's removed and uh, not included in uh, uh, APM. Yes, AVI code. That yeah, it the, was they part took out of monitoring. process from, AV, from Avocode when they turned it into APM. Yeah, you'd have to ask Microsoft why um, we can't address. I, I'm sorry, we can't. Do you know the roadmap? I, no. Even if I knew something, I couldn't tell you. I, I cannot speak for Microsoft on future things. Thanks. Sorry. Awesome. Thank you very much for coming. If you have more questions, you hey, want to come and talk on one of them. Come up and talk. Give us a chance to shut down our laptop.